Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, Joseph and I, because Lisa is on vacation overseas and I'm sure having a wonderful time, but Joseph and I are going to unpack a folktale that I think is in everybody's casual vocabulary, uh, the Pied Piper of Hamlin where I think we get the phrase about having to pay the piper. But we are going to uh, read you the tale, uh, and then we're just going to see what its uh, depth psychology, symbolic, and archetypal implications are. And before Deb reads the fairy tale, I would like to thank all of you who have joined us on our Patreon page and are supporting our good work here at This Jungian Life. Our mission is to introduce people internationally to Jung's ideas, and particularly to help people see that these concepts are relevant to their day-to-day lives, that these concepts can grant a kind of meaning, a kind of insight that is just so essential And we need your help to do that. We have chosen not to engage corporate sponsors so that we can dedicate our time to you. So please go to our website, thisjungianlife.com, and consider being our patron. Okay, I'm going to read the tale as it is recorded in the Grimm's Brothers fairy tale collection and I'm just going to change the pronunciation of the town from its German, Hameln, to Hamlin, which is more familiar. And I think I will also do a horrible job of trying to pronounce anything in German. <laughs> so, so here is the tale. In the year 1284, a mysterious man appeared in Hamlin. He was wearing a coat of many-colored bright cloth, for which reason he was called the Pied Piper. He claimed to be a rat catcher, and he promised that for a certain sum he would rid the city of all mice and rats. The citizens struck a deal, promising him a certain price. The rat catcher then took a small fife from his pocket and began to blow on it. Rats and mice immediately came from every house and gathered around him. When he thought that he had them all, he led them to the river Weiser where he pulled up his clothes and walked into the water. The animals all followed him, fell in, and drowned. Now that the citizens had been freed of their plague, they regretted having promised so much money, and using all kinds of excuses, they refused to pay him. Finally, he went away, bitter and angry. He returned on June 26th, St. John's and St. Paul's Day, early in the morning at 7 o'clock, Others say it was at noon, now dressed in a hunter's costume with a dreadful look on his face and wearing a strange red hat. He sounded his fife in the streets, but this time it wasn't rats and mice that came to him, but rather children, a great number of boys and girls from their fourth year on. Among them was the mayor's grown daughter. The swarm followed him and he led them into a mountain where he disappeared with them. All this was seen by a babysitter who, carrying a child in her arms, had followed them from a distance, but had then turned around and carried the news back to the town. The anxious parents ran in droves to the town gates seeking their children. The mothers cried out and sobbed pitifully. Within the hour, messengers were sent everywhere by water and by land, inquiring of the children or any of them had been seen, but it was all for naught. In total, 130 were lost. Two, as some say, had lagged behind and came back. 
One of them was blind and the other mute. The blind one was not able to point out the place, but was able to tell how they had followed the piper. The mute one was able to point out the place, although he, or she, had heard nothing. One little boy in shirt sleeves had gone along with the others, but had turned back to fetch his jacket and thus escaped the tragedy, for when he returned the others had already disappeared into a cave within a hill. This cave is still shown. Until the middle of the 18th century, and probably still today, the street through which the children were led to the town gate was called the Drumless, Soundless, Quiet Street, because no dancing or music was allowed there. Indeed, when a bridal procession on its way to church crossed this street, the musicians would have to stop playing. The mountain near Hamlin, where all the children disappeared, is called Poppenberg. Two stone monuments in the form of crosses have been erected there, one on the left side and one on the right. Some say the children were led into a cave and that they came out again in Transylvania. The citizens of Hamlin recorded this event in their town register, and they came to date all their proclamations according to the years and days since the loss of their children. According to Siegfried, the 22nd rather than the 26th of June was entered in the town register. The following lines were inscribed on the town hall. In the year 1284 after the birth of Christ, from Hamlin were led away, 130 children born at this place, led away by a piper into a mountain. And on a new gate was inscribed, 272 years after the magician led the 130 children from the city. In the year 1572, the mayor had the story portrayed in the church windows. The accompanying inscription has become largely illegible, in addition, a coin was minted in memory of the event. So this story from the Brothers Grimm seems to have some foundation in a, a folk legend where something along these lines uh, that affected a number of children from a German village may actually have been an, an event in the outer world. Our uh, inclination is to take a look at it as psychic material a psychic tale. So let's begin to unpack that, shall we, Joseph? Well, there's two lenses that Marie-Louise von Franz offers. She was kind of the, the master of fairy tales in a lot of ways. She said that fairy tales seem to have sprouted up for one reason of another, but survived because various cultures found archetypal messages that helped them and their children in some fashion, taught them something, taught them how to figure something out. Sometimes von Franz would think about a fairy tale in terms of an event that has happened in the collective unconscious, that humanity as a whole had somehow sorted something, and fairy tales like a collective dream are signaling that sometimes as analysts will interpret a fairy tale as if it is a dream that has happened in one person or another's mind so that we can get a sense of its relevance. So it's 1284, strangely specific year. It's funny, I was just Googling what happened in 1284. There was a new regent on the throne. Edward II had taken the throne. It's difficult to know what that would have been, but a mysterious man appears in the town. So right away we're in this archetype of the stranger. I also just want to go back to pick up something that you just mentioned, um, which is uh, how von Franz thought about uh, events happening in the collective unconscious. And isn't that the way that uh, we get... Uh, the mother archetype through our experience with our personal mother. There is this story in which a stranger uh, may have come to town and taps into that substrate that runs through everything because it's so significant so that it becomes really loaded with archetypal import. 
And that's exactly what's happened in, in this tale. It is something may have happened along these lines in the external world, but it goes deep in the human psyche that we really, we really get it. That if you don't pay the piper, what can happen? And I think that's it on its most sort of surface level that, you know, the, the townspeople made a deal and then they didn't hold up their end of the deal. He did them a service and then it was sort of like, well, I can imagine all, all these, um, you know, town elders sitting around talking about, well, you know, we don't have to pay them, you know. Uh, we've been battling this rat problem. Our coffers are pretty low, um, and the rats are dead now. So, you know, if the deed is done, if we don't pay them, so what? And that's a very dangerous attitude in the psyche. If we don't pay attention and we don't compensate balancing the scales in the psyche, that that really uh, has can have very big consequences. Well, I think the way that our modern culture has distilled the details of this fairy tale tells us that there is something enduring that carries even from medieval times or perhaps even earlier that is still connected to our culture, the idea that we do have to bear the consequences of an activity which we had enjoyed, perhaps enjoyed with without a sense of foresight. You know, it's time to pay the piper. Let's let's come back and work the fairy tales so we can give people a sense of how they might play around with fairy tales. So a stranger has appeared in the village. Always interesting. Often in the ancient world, foreboding some kind of change. When we think about the current tribalism that we still experience, even though we all feel very modern, there is a certain protective boundary that we are used to. And when the stranger comes in, it is a foretelling that something that we don't expect could happen, good, bad, or indifferent. It's new psychic content. What is this? I don't know what it is. It's strange. It's unfamiliar. It doesn't necessarily have a negative spin, and that's part of it, is what do we make of the new content? Do we reject it? Do we persecute it? Do we welcome it? Do we use it? But this stranger, uh, the, this tale says he's a mysterious man wearing a coat of many-colored bright cloth, for which reason he was called a pied piper, which means a uh, term that means many-colored his initial presentation doesn't indicate danger. Uh, and he's carrying a musical instrument, although we might kind of think about that as Pan's pipes. Absolutely. I, I can't imagine how most people in the medieval world dressed, but I would imagine that colors were difficult to obtain wearing or having access to something that's designed in this unusual way would have been strange. Perhaps it would have signaled something to that culture. Perhaps it's a signal that he's a performer. But there's some special status that is displayed in the way he looks. And he calls up the archetype of the trickster, too, the jester, dressed in many colors, can go either way. At any rate, one would think he would be pretty attention-getting. And there is something magical about the pipes. And there are many, many an expression about pipers in particular. Pipes are more magical, more archetypal than, let's say, violins. <laughs> if this story were about playing a violin, we'd go, nah, I don't think so. And the fife, or the little kind of pipe with the holes in it, really emerged in the Middle Ages. It was unusual. It was kind of an invention. It was something that was resilient. You could stick it in a pocket, take it around with you. And it was a musical object that could easily be acquired or created. Mm -hmm. So something about that fife or the Irish penny whistle, 
is a new idea. So there's something novel about this person. He is bringing something perhaps that has just emerged. Mm -hmm. One might think he's going to perform in some fashion, but instead he comes in with this strange foresight that somehow he knows what the problem is in the village, although in the tale no one's kind of told him. But now that that immediately sets him in a slightly otherworldly place. How are you showing up at my door telling me that you absolutely know my family's got this problem with one thing or another? So let's um, think for a minute about now what is this problem? Other people that have elaborated on this story have a really wonderful time about um, embroidering you know, that there were rats and mice coming out of every crevice and every corner. and They have a glorious time, you know, really um, bumping this uh, imagery up as a, as a terrible plague and a real infestation, which the Grimm brothers don't do. But nevertheless, um, our Piper knows that there's a problem. So what does it mean for a town to have a rat and rodent infestation. What are rats? If we just think about them within our own culture and European culture, that rats are strange, that they're elusive, that they kind of creep in and pilfer, take our food. Perhaps they leave their droppings, evidence of being there. And of course, in medieval times, they brought fleas and the fleas carried the bubonic plague. Although I don't know at the time whether people understood it was fleas on the rats, but certainly rats seemed connected because often the rats were the first thing to die. The rats would begin staggering out into the streets, and people would begin to hear them squealing, actually, in the night, which was this haunting precursor to something that's going wrong in the natural world. And without knowledge of epidemiology, people are mystified that something's kind of going on. But but a harbinger of danger. Imagine people had figured out that the rats can be carriers of dangerous things. But symbolically, what do we make of our own rats? Well, I, I'm still back on some of the... Uh symbolism of, of rats, and of course I have turned to one of our primary resources that we recommend over and over again to listeners called The Book of Symbols, a Reflection on Archetypal Images, and um, as a hand on the front cover, it's worth its weight in gold, and you can find it on Amazon. It explores images like rats from both, you know, from all sides in a multifaceted way, but of course, we know that rats and mice um, hide. They slip through little tiny cracks. And we've had a house in the country that had mice, and oh my goodness, they are elusive. They are hard to get rid of. They're like ghosts. Yeah, they survive, um, you know, basically everything that we could throw at them. Uh, and of course, they, um, you know, they don't sit around in the living room. They're in the basement, they're in the attic, they're in the walls. They get in the kitchen cabinets and drawers that, that absolutely astonish me. They are prolific, but they're also featured. Um, I remember seeing the Walt Disney original Cinderella movie where the little mice sew uh, Cinderella's gown. And that because they're tiny and insignificant, they're the perfect agents for, for heroic deeds. And so they're a wonderful image of the unconscious in both its uh, negative and more positive form. But we might imagine, to go back to the tale, that the town of Hamlin is infested by what you were talking about, Joseph, the sort of the plague-carrying, disease-ridden, nefarious aspect of rodents, of rats. And so we might imagine... From a purely psychological standpoint, if somebody had a dream like that, we might be looking at perhaps 
issues that are gnawing away Mm -hmm. in the psyche, those small unresolved complexes that we can never quite get our hands on, we might catch a little glimpse of, but there's evidence that, you know, the wire has been chewed through or there's a hole in the cereal box or Mm -hmm. rats can even gnaw through cement. I mean, there's this extraordinary capacity to get to whatever it is that they're seeking. And so people will often talk about annoying fear, like something's bothering me. It's like running around in my body. Yes. It's yes. like something bad is going to happen. Ugh. And you can't put your finger on it because it's below consciousness. It's under the floorboards <laughs> or, you know, somewhere invisible. And yet you can sort of hear it scrabbling away in the night, as it were. Uh, something is gnawing away at me. So if we see a rat in our imaginations or other ways, most of us will ascribe fairly negative qualities to it. Now, I recognize in India, there is actually a, a veneration of rats, which is connected to Ganesha. But here, I think we're talking about a different concern, a darkness that's projected on to rats. So from a purely psychological standpoint, we might be able to say that the the villagers, which represent some kind of a conscious state, have found these shadow issues. Mm-hmm. Only get rid of the disgusting part of us, the stealing part of us, the bestial part of ourselves that just won't submit to being banished or won't leave us alone which is shadow. It's absolutely, it's shadow. And here's my, um, you know, my fantasy about this uh, little town is that everybody knows uh, that there's a huge rat problem and nobody's done anything about it. Uh, Now, in some of the other elaborations, they say, well, yes, of course they got cats and yes, of course they hired you know, rat catchers, or they put out poison, or, yeah, they did all the sort of common sense things. But here is this terrible infestation of shadow that has become huge and that the collective cannot address and cannot solve in any of the usual ways. And so they have this sort of magical thinking (laughs) kind of thing. They're going to outsource it. I'm not going to deal with my shadow problem. Uh, I'm going to hire this guy, and he'll take care of it for me. So someone comes into our life and says, you know, I have this three-step method. You know, it's an affirmation. (laughs) It's a weekend workshop. It's this and it's that. And when you're done, you'll, you'll just triumph over all of these difficulties, and it'll all be bright and shiny, or we're going to magically take away the gnawing problems of one's life. And how appealing is that? Of course. Mm-hmm. I mean, if, if we don't know a lot about the transformative process, we'll spend a lot of times. And by the way, I'm talking about myself in my 20s, kind of chasing self-help and small ideas and little interventions, thinking that that's really going to get rid of my rats. and The stuff that's gnawing at me won't won't be there anymore. Mm -hmm. Take a pill. Mm -hmm. The right medication will take care of, you know, whatever that problem is that you have. And you won't actually have to grapple with it or with yourself or some of the implications of it. You know, we just want to outsource it and have it go away. And of course, we know that there's always a price to banishing the dark sides of our personality because they remain somewhere in the unconscious and they still keep eating at the pipes and the wires and making us experience strange, unfortunate things. But for some reason, this magical figure shows up knowing that you've got all these shadow problems in your culture, (laughs) these unresolved villainous qualities. And all you have to do is Let me play a tune or let me work my magic and everything's going to get cleaned up. It'll be tidy and you won't have to suffer these pesky 
parts of your psycho-spiritual structure. Mm -hmm. Now, the villagers are also one-sided. You know, they're taking the perspective of the ego. And from the ego's perspective, anything that's interfering with the ego's success is a problem. Now, of course, we're dealing with that in terms of the extinction of species. How do we relate to nature? Not convenient to the ego. Oh, well, got to get all, get rid of all those, whatever that might be. So, so the this village really does have a huge shadow problem, which they have refused to grapple, and so they simply outsource it. They're not going to engage in some kind of relationship that that has to do with meaning, that has to do. Uh, with what they're not dealing with. It's all ego, and that's the answer. Just hire this guy, and off he goes, and he gets rid of their rodent problem. And then they don't want to pay him, because after all, it was easy for him. You know, you know, really, all the guy did was he showed up, he played some music, his tunes on his magic pipe, uh, walked down to the water, all the rats followed him and drowned. You know, I'm not going to pay a lot for that. It was really easy. It was no big deal. This price that we negotiated um, is really way too high. And besides which, if we stiff him, what's he going to do about it? The rats are dead now anyway. So too bad. Here's a really nefarious ego attitude. And of course, it happens to all of us that we, we do something and we don't really want to consider the consequences. We don't really want to consider paying the price. I'll just take the shortcut. I can get away with this. It's not that big a deal. There is something particularly narcissistic about it. Mm -hmm. And because the narcissistic complex does not have any room to deal with the irrational, with the personal shadow, even with just a hearty self-critique. We can make things go away and stay away so much the better. It occurs to me that we're also dealing in some ways with Freud's idea of taboo, that even the person who says that they can take away the problem or they can help you suppress your shadow material in some ways, is associated with that shadow material. So the Pied Piper is also now associated with the rat-like qualities of the villagers. And through that association, we can have this feeling of someone being contaminated. For instance, a friend of mine had to go through a divorce and was so grateful the attorney that absolutely solved all the problems and really imagined that he would have a social relationship with this person that it, he felt was kind of heroically had solved it. And to the, uh, he related to me, the lawyer said, you know, I know it seems like that right now, but most people don't ever want to see their lawyers again because they associate them with mm -hmm. this really painful, somewhat traumatic experience. And so thank you very much. But I'd be surprised. <laughs> How are you going mm -hmm. to feel after this all finally resolves and you just want to move on? You don't want to keep thinking about it. And I'm going to represent this ordeal you've gone through. So the Piper is suddenly perhaps dangerous because of the power that is been able to enact. He's also perhaps has some kind of connection to the rat-like levels of things because he has power over it, which would make him a very ambivalent figure when he comes back. Now, that's uh, such a good point that uh, he who deals with shadow is also contaminated by shadow. And this guy is pretty peculiar looking. Uh, I can see that he would be easy to reject, easy to discount, because after all, the villagers didn't want to deal with their shadow problem in the first place. So it's probably no mystery that they don't want to deal 
with the person who does deal with the shadow problem. It's all part of what has been denied and dishonored and banished from from consciousness. Back in the uh, early 1900s, people who worked in slaughterhouses were disqualified to sit as jurors in the legal system because the thought was they couldn't possibly think humanely. They couldn't possibly measure out what was necessary because they're, they traffic in this constant slaughtering process. Again, this contamination by association is something deep in our bones about that. Right. And, you know, it's still very much the same. I mean, the people who do societal dirty work, people who worked in slaughterhouses, uh, none of us go to slaughterhouses. We go to the supermarket. That's very different to buy, you know, some kind of meat. And I eat meat. I'm, I'm guilty, too. But I don't see the shadow side, and I don't want to. And I pay all kinds of middlemen, and so do most of us, to bring that produce, that uh, the meat, the carrier, the poultry, all of it, uh, into the grocery store where it is very nicely and tidily and sanit- sanitarily processed for me. Right, absolutely. And I think many urban children for a long time don't really know where those things come from because we feel we have to protect mm. them. I also have to say that we as analysts get some of this cross taboo energy. Mm-hmm. I show up at a party if I tell somebody I'm a psychoanalyst, there's this little look of concern in their eyes. And the question is always, are you analyzing me right now? Yeah. And uh, I've suddenly become dangerous. I'm the Pied Piper. Yeah. You know? it, it's all such a great uh, way of elaborating on our relationship to shadow. Uh, We don't like it. It repels us. We're pretty leery about it. And I can certainly see that the villagers were pretty happy to hire somebody to just deal with it for them. So then what happens? The piper brings them to the river and drowns them, which shows up in people's dreams a lot, that something either is going into water or coming out of water, Mm -hmm. which we often interpret as something moving in or out of the unconscious. And if it's moving into the water, there's a way in which it's fallen out of the grip of the conscious mind and returned to some other realm. And then the piper comes back. And this time, he's wearing a different outfit. This time, he's dressed as um, a hunter, and he has a red cap wouldn't you think that the townspeople would have taken a clue that this time he means business, this time he's on the hunt, and it won't be for the rats because they're not there anymore. The red cap in Scottish folklore is associated with a a murderous goblin, and the red cap was dipped in the blood of the victims, and therefore it was brilliant red, but this greatly ominous quality to it. And, of course, the color red would have been associated with blood. People have seen blood. They know that redness, if nothing else. So there is something tickling at our minds and at the minds of the villager. That redness, that's foreboding. And we use red just naturally, as an alarm. Stop sign. Mm -hmm. It's not like stop if you wish to. It's stop. Red alert. And I think the original title of the tale most of us know as Little Red Riding Hood was Little Red Cap. So red red is attention getting. And of course, as you've already said, red is the color of blood, which is and was thought to be in ancient times, you know, really the life force itself. So I can imagine it as the life force uh, in both its malevolent and its uh, generative aspects. But we would notice if somebody is wearing a red cap. 
There's an announcement there. And even the hunter's costume, that every culture has specialized clothing, depending on the task that one has. But I have to say that if, if I'm in a restaurant here in Virginia Beach and somebody walks in in kind of hunter's camo, maybe has a rifle on their shoulder, that's going to get my attention. It's, it's, <laughs> it, it better. Doesn't quite, yeah, it's, well, it doesn't quite make sense. We're here, you know, having, uh, you know, spaghetti. And uh, how is the hunter, you know, in this realm? And, of course, we could tell ourselves it's something about it. But we would really notice that this person's prepared for something that doesn't seem congruent with the environment, but, of course, it foreshadows. Mm-hmm. And he has a dreadful look on his face. Yes. The red hat is weird. I'm kind of thinking about the townspeople who see him coming back in dressed this way and the dreadful look on his face who don't pay attention. They don't get it like, whoa. Last time when he played his pipes, uh, all the rats followed him. There's something about this guy that is really, we need to pay attention. He has a certain kind of power. This time he's dressed like a hunter. Whoa, hold it. Wait a minute. We need to, you know, kind of try to see if we can stop him in his tracks and see what's really bothering him, or maybe we better just pay up. But what I'm getting to here is there's this witless, feckless inattentiveness where they they don't pay attention to something that they should have paid attention to from the very beginning, such as their shadow problem manifested by the rats. Uh, They're not paying the the piper uh, the fee that they agreed to pay, and they're not recognizing that this guy is dangerous. If he could do that with rats, what's next? And how we do that all the time in our lives, uh, that there are all these clues, all these little signs, and then people are you know, sort of radically surprised by, but I didn't think this would happen. Well, we think how many times have we funded some insurgent group in another country and kind of given them a certain amount of power only to have them turn around, and then use it in ways that the U.S. has not been able to control. Mm -hmm. I mean, this idea that something comes back, we set something in motion, and then it shows up, and it's not not behaving the way we thought it was going to. And this speaks so directly about the unconscious as well, that we may have a kind of solar, rational assessment of things. Uh, We're going to dismiss this guy, and that'll be the end of it, and he won't be able to do anything. Mm -hmm. Case closed. But the unconscious is uncanny and unpredictable. And when it is agitated, it has access to us and to things. You just gave such a great example of the law of unintended consequences, that we provide arms to insurgent groups, and then when they're used in ways that we didn't expect and don't want, we're shocked, you know, as if this could never have been anticipated. Or, you know, what's um, up in our culture right now is all the effects of screen time on adolescents, but on all of us. And we don't really know all the effects and especially the long-term effects on young people whose brains are still literally growing. You know, how many of us are able to be sufficiently vigilant uh, with our young people who, by the time they're teenagers, have a lot of autonomy and willfulness of their own? And What would it take to really monitor screen time, uh, not to mention our own screen time? Uh, whether it's, um, you know, all of the social media stuff or uh, serial kinds of things on, on our laptops or whatever it is. Of, well, wait a minute. What are the consequences that we probably shouldn't be quite so surprised by later on any more than the villagers should have been so surprised when the Pied Piper stole their children? They could have, would have, should have known 
something not good is about to happen. <laughs> I want to pick up a little detail from the Grimm's Tale, because it's so strangely specific. So many details here are oddly specific. He returned on June 26th, St. John's and St. Paul's Day, early in the morning at 7 o'clock. Boy, that is highly, <laughs> that is very, very specific. Yeah. And just being curious about that, St. Paul's Day is a liturgical feast that is dedicated to the martyr, Paul. Another foreshadowing. Mm -hmm. In a sense, the children are going to be martyred. There is something devastating is going to happen to someone. Mm -hmm. St. John is a celebration of John the Baptist. So again, a strange, interesting feeling. But what I'm imagining is you know, the bells ring. There's a call to the cathedral. It's in a medieval town. People are involved or preparing to be involved in a kind of collective, perhaps religious process, which again, we can be consciously identified with the idea we've been baptized, so all our sins have miraculously left. So there's nothing we have to do about it. All of the rats, the pestilential rats inside our soul were washed away in the river, baptismally, and that I have avoided being martyred or crucified in some fashion, that this, this has been, burden has been lifted from me through this archetypal religious process. Of course, the danger is in anyone who's spent a lot of time in church communities, the ego feels very cleansed. And yet, the shadow, <laughs> the little rats of gossip and, and uh, hypocrisy, you know, are biting everybody's ankles mm -hmm. in these institutions that don't make room for the ongoing relationship to the unconscious, to the irrational, to the instinctive, to the dangerous. There is no way uh, to simply avoid, shortcut, whitewash, outsource our shadow problem. We have to face it and deal with it ourselves, as Jung says, in so many ways and in so many places. And it's not just a moral imperative that, you know, you really should. The real incentive to doing that is that it makes us more whole. That if we can incorporate those parts of ourselves in consciousness, we, we are paradoxically enough freed from having to act it out unconsciously. That is also where the treasure is found. New sources of energy, new sources of creativity, insight, depth, interiority. There's a real plus to really dealing with our own shadows here. So the shadow's been put into the unconscious. Viper mm -hmm. shows up, and he is in his hunting aspect, in his bloody cap right. aspect, and begins to play the pipe. And again, quite specifically, every child who is four years old or older swarms to him and he takes them into the mountains and they disappear. So the banishing of the shadow is now costing the loss of the children. Of course, this is symbolic. So to lose one's child is an enormous loss. Uh, the child, both religiously and psychically, has to do with all of our potentials. Mm -hmm. It's the future. You know that that baby is born, and who or what will he or she be? Uh, there is a future, and we, we want to live forward through our children and our grandchildren. And so to take the children, you know, 
uh, as a simple sort of moral thing, it seems like, well, wait, the kids didn't do anything wrong. Why should they be punished? So we have to look at it through an archetypal and symbolic lens, that what will be taken away and disappeared is your own potential, your own inner creative children who might have become, you know, butchers and bakers and candlestick makers to, you know, quote from an old nursery rhyme, but that they are our own futurity. And that is the price that is paid for ignoring the shadow that is imaged as the rats. So now there's a a devastating, a catastrophic effect But really, there actually have been two catastrophic effects. One is the seeming banishing of the shadow, and everybody's clean and happy and in the ego. Then there's a second catastrophic event from this very objective lens, which is the loss of all of this potential. And there is a witness to this. There is a babysitter who had been protecting a child clearly under four. Exactly. The child who was attended to, and one might wonder, uh, in a, if we literalize this, of, you know, and where were the grown-ups when all these kids were starting to swarm out into the streets? At the feast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, people were not attentive, but the babysitter was holding a child in her arms. She was attentive. A wonderful, wonderful insight that the mother archetype Mm -hmm. would have dealt with all of this differently. And often when the ego is broken away from the unconscious, there is a distance between the ego and the environment. There isn't a nurturing, there isn't a caretaking. And the village people don't take care of the Pied Piper either. They don't celebrate him, reward him. They don't even have gratitude. So there is this real loss of the feminine when the rats are taken away. The loss of relationship, the loss of connection, the loss of a real felt attentiveness to that part of the psyche that has potential, that is young, that needs protecting. You need to keep an eye out on your kids. You know, we we don't just witlessly go about our day and uh, let the kids take care of themselves. They need supervision and care and and breakfast and and lunch. Uh, So here again is another image of uh, simple inattentiveness and the price that can be paid. Now, interestingly, the babysitter is the one who witnessed it. And for some reason, it reminds me of the abduction of Persephone and the parents. A mother doesn't see this happen, but there is an observer, there's Hecate, who's watching, and she's the one who decides that she's finally going to tell Demeter what has transpired. So there's some ancient echo in this observing feminine. Mm-hmm. There's an interesting decision. We could imagine that he is the mother principle in the psyche. She is following behind, seeing what's happening to the kids, but she has to come to this moment. Is she going to keep following the kids, or is she going to run back and tell everybody what's happening? What a devastating choice. It's that impossible Mm -hmm. decision. I'm imagining, you know, this, the caretaking and feminine mother principle uh, confers escape, and then there is the immunity of, of the deaf child and the blind child. One of them cannot see and thus cannot follow, and the other doesn't hear the music uh, and cannot follow. Uh, so th- these are all ways where, you know, th- that are imaged as ways to not get caught in possession, which is what happens to the children. They are possessed. And interestingly, um, just a little bit before, the babysitter goes and tells the parents, and they ran in droves to the town gate to seek the children. 
where the mothers cry out and sob pitifully, and then they send messengers wherever they can. They won't go into the woods, which again goes to this ego that is trapped in the confines of this very familiar, structured, conscious world. I'll, I'll run around what I know, but I'm not going to go into the mountains, into the forest. I may send messengers around. Maybe someone else will do that for me, much like the Pied Piper. Anybody seen anything? But they, ego gets stopped at the gate. And I love what you were saying, Deb, about the ones that were immune, the ones that survived. A blind child who is able to describe what they heard, the deaf, mute child who can describe what he saw, and then the little boy who ran back to get his jacket, mm -hmm. where he went off into the chilly mountains. He had some sense of self-preservation. He actually had this little seed of foresight. Hey, wait a minute. We're going to go off into the mountains. It's going to be cold. I might need a little bit of something. He's able to remain in connection to his instincts, actually. And that part of him is saying, wait a minute, this is dangerous, but <laughs> if I had at least a little something. Yes, he, uh, he exhibits um, ego a and a sense of foresight uh, that the, the townspeople clearly lack. But what happens afterward, I don't know how much this is rooted in fact, but that afterward all this is really taken in. It's really um, memorialized. There are... Uh, carvings. There are. There's a street where no music is ever paid, played. The, they really remember this for you know hundreds of years afterward, with mourning and with regret. Of uh, we take it in and we remember, and probably all of us do that too. That we sometimes learn something in a way that is very painful. So a process is set in motion, that there's a cavalier attitude in the beginning, there's a disconnect from the power of the unconscious, there's a great suffering, a crucifixion, mm -hmm. in a sense that happens, the horrible, devastating loss of a child, and then a, a declaration that this will not be forgotten, that, that we will understand our suffering, that we will monitor the world differently, do something differently going forward, and not be cavalier and thoughtless or feckless, that the choices that we make matter, and there are consequences to what we set in motion, even if in the moment it seems easy, enjoyable, quick solutions to things. So it's a sobering tale about a, a layer of the archaic psyche and the need to orient to it with a tremendous amount of respect. Today's dreamer is a man. He's 37 years old, uh, and he is a translator from uh, Japanese to English uh, and part of the video game industry. And here's his dream. A party with colleagues comes to an end. I settle down with male and a female colleague to watch a film on a large and comfortable sofa. The film begins. It's starring the Japanese actress Miko Kaji. The opening shot is of a large, grand, hotel-like building in Japan. It's angular, with black and gold detailing, having a Frank Lloyd Wright-like feel about it, suggesting the period setting of the film to be in the 1920s. The hotel seems, in fact, to be more like a luxurious mental institution. Miko Kaji plays an inmate of this institution, and she seems to be held there somewhat against her will. A shot looking down from a mezzanine into the main hall shows the heroine defiantly resisting her treatment, 
dressed in an ornate nightgown of white lace. She faces off sullenly against the manager of the institution, a diminutive Japanese man in a tuxedo who looks more like a hotel manager. She floods the hall with a shallow inpouring of seawater. The manager is highly perturbed by the woman's display of emotion and disobedience. It's clear that this institution doesn't know how to treat this woman. Within the hall, a large letter in an ornate frame, similar to the style of the building, is displayed, written in Japanese. It's a letter mandating the woman's treatment. The film continues, and we learn more about the source of the woman's troubles. She lost a child. She makes an alliance with another inmate, a similarly white-attired younger woman. The two of them resolve to escape the institution to resolve the issue of the lost child, setting out for The Place of Lost Children. The Place of Lost Children is in the heart of a forest, an industrial waste ground. The younger woman holds a lantern to light the way. The ground is littered with dead children all alike. They are wrapped in bright red shawls, completely concealing their bodies, the face of each covered with a totally blank theatrical mask. The younger woman moves around the bodies, removing the masks to try to identify the older woman's lost child. Every child has the same face, a cartoonish face that I recognize, Pug from the comic strip The Bash Street Kids. I think this is a face that not even a mother could love. As I watch the film, I remark to myself, this depiction is not very realistic. But if it was more realistic, it would be too horrible to look at. The women continue the search, but in vain. They discover that the missing child is at the bottom of a nearby dark black pool. The child has dissolved and left an image on the surface of the water. It's very similar to Pug, but more disfigured. The face is scarred and the eyes are damaged. The film ends and I'm back in the comfortable lounge. An older man is present, about 50 or so, looks confident, successful, an entrepreneur or self-made man of some sort, a man who plays golf. He's telling me with great excitement about how he used to know the actress in his youth, singing her praises. Were they lovers? I notice that my own father has appeared. He's listening intently to the man as well. The man shows me an illustrated memoir that he's working on, partly about the woman, but about his life in general. I'm surprised by the man's artistic zeal. He seems more like the practical type. The artwork is that of a beginner, but it's clearly powered by something very genuine. He shows me the last page, which is painted very thickly with oil paints that are still wet. He tries to explain it to me, but it's difficult. In a final effort to make me understand, he gathers up the wet paint with his fingers into a shape. It resembles Uluru, also known as Ayer's Rock. For context... He adds, this dream occurred midway through a short course of therapy, depth psychology, which began because I've experienced lengthy periods of depression throughout life beginning in early childhood. A few weeks after the dream, which he had related to his therapist, I was shocked to see an image which seemed to have been borrowed from my dream. It was of Melania Trump, walking past some strange red Christmas trees as part of an article about her odd choice of decoration for Christmas in the White House. The trees also had white bonnets on the top. They looked very much like the dead children in my dream, and similarly, Melania Trump seemed to resonate with luxuriously confined women in my dream, and Trump himself with the older man at the end of the dream. I later learned that the white bonnets weren't part of Melania Trump's decorative choice, but had been photoshopped in as a reference to the TV show The Handmaid's Tale. He says the main feelings in the dream were a sense of curiosity and detachment when watching the film, as I was somewhat removed from the events. A sense of wonder and positive feeling toward the man who appeared at the end of the dream. And then he adds for additional context, when I was two, my two-month-old brother died of cot death. 
I was present at the time. We were traveling on a train, and he was pronounced dead by a doctor on the train with me witnessing the whole event. My paternal grandmother also lost a child to stillbirth, and my mother often remarked on the co a coincidence. These details seem to have obvious connections to the dream content. Miko uh, Kaji seemed highly appropriate for the role. She typically portrayed wronged women who get revenge. Okay, this is a very long dream, and let's see if we can parse it out. Um, I noticed right away, um, which often happens in dreams, that when we are approaching new psychic content, that dreamers often will report, I was watching a TV show, or I was up above the event, you know, sort of like being in the sky box at a, in a stadium. Uh, so looking down on it, uh, rather than really being a part of the dream itself, and sometimes new content does present this way. There's something compassionate in allowing the dream ego to have some distance from the narrative because it is so painful. The dream has a lot of details in it, undoubtedly. What I'd like to do is to just condense some things down. We know they're in a film. There's a woman who's held in a luxurious mental institution, apparently, she is struggling, doesn't want to be there, doesn't want the treatment. And then something, in my mind, extraordinary happens, that she is somehow able to flood the hole with an inpouring of seawater. And, and that's the moment where I suddenly think, oh, this isn't just an ordinary woman, that this, <laughs> this female figure is, has a certain kind of mythic valence to it, that she is associated with the ocean. Then we find out she's lost a child. She goes on a search. So one of the things that I'm wondering about, which is a more psychodynamic orientation to the dream, is I can imagine he's a one-year-old boy, and the mother experiences a, a heartbreaking trauma. Sudden infant death is, you know, it's like someone just took an ax to your heart. The shock, the agony, yes. uh, the devastation. And I can imagine the enormous amount of time that it would reasonably take for a mother to even find her footing again. And also how that would change her availability to her one-year-old son. Yes. Through no fault of her own, yeah. this strike of fate. I was uh, really struck by that detail from his, from our dreamer's life and how in, in his comments, and I know they're very brief and not about the whole thing, but what he says is, first of all, he witnessed the whole event and it, it's not available to conscious memory in all likelihood, but nevertheless, it's it's in his experience. It's what Christopher Bolas, uh, a psycho psychologist, calls the unthought known. Oh. He lived it, and it's it's there in his body and in his psyche, but not as a cognitive memory because he was too little. However, what he also says is. My paternal grandmother lost a child also to stillbirth, and my mother often remarked on the coincidence. Now that feels like a bit of a distant kind of commentary. It's just historical fact when uh, we have some family trauma here. Having a child, when you have carried that child in your body, and it, the child is stillborn or dies of SIDS, it is um, an unbelievable loss. Bonding with a baby is intense, and uh, the, the sudden loss is just simply devastating. So here is a family trauma, undoubtedly. And I'm thinking, too, it's, it's significant that they were traveling. You know, you're not home, you're not grounded, you're somehow in between. And then I'm thinking that it's, you know, there's kind of an echo perhaps in the dream of 
this distance, the psychological distance, as if he's watching a film with this Japanese uh, actress in it. Working on, on that line that you were speaking of so heartfully, Deb, you know, that the woman floods the hall with a shallow inpouring of seawater, and of course our tears mm-hmm. are somewhat similar to seawater's. I can just imagine the enormous flood of grief and tears and mm-hmm. and heartbreak. Right. And, and he says in the dream, the manager, think of that symbolically, the manager is highly perturbed by the woman's display of emotion and disobedience. Well, wouldn't there be a lot of emotion? And the tension between, of course, wanting to tend to the tremendous amount of grief and what are the cultural norms about visible grief versus private grief and the tension between the duty to the living children uh, and yet still honoring this devastating experience. The manager, manage her, (laughs) her. (laughs) So um, whether it's the mother's own struggle to manage her enormous grief and and be caregiving to her children or the culture or perhaps the father trying to contain or help contain, artfully or not, the overwhelming experience. I'm also picking up on kind of the ghostly image of the actress being dressed in a white nightgown and then the other younger woman who is also dressed in a white nightgown. And I'm not sure about this, but I think in Japan, uh, white is is what you wear in mourning. Um, But it's also sort of a ghostly uh, image, and that these women are encapsulated in an institution that's supposed to be about treatment, but it looks like this big sort of Frank Lloyd Wright, black, gold, ornate building, which of course, is not Frank Lloyd Wright's style, but nevertheless, this kind of careful encapsulation and the mandated, quote, treatment, unquote, until the seawater comes flooding in. And I think your your association uh, to the tears and the similar kind of salty water that makes up our tears and is part of the archetypal sea. And then off they go to look for the the child in the place of lost children. They go on a quest. A little piece uh, in the first paragraph that I also found interesting is um, that the hotel slash mental institution seems luxurious. Mm -hmm. And so I would also have a question for the dreamer. Is luxury a way of trying to meet grief? Make it nice. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a kind of pampering. Yeah. Of course, when someone is in grief, they should be accommodated greatly. But also it can be a pattern, a way of responding to loss that is repeated throughout a, a lifetime. Yes. So the dream maker is just, for whatever reason, putting just a little check mark. You know, look, look at this relationship to luxury. But going uh, with you along the search for the lost child. Uh, And the dream comes up as he has started psychotherapy. So um, here comes the (laughs) seawater. And our nice hotel and everything very ornate with a manager and mandated treatment is starting to be flooded. Things are starting to uh, dissolve. The defenses, we might say, are starting to devolve. And off the two women go. Uh, to the place of lost children, which is a really kind of stark and somewhat horrifying scene. The ground is littered with dead children, all wrapped in bright red shawls, and all of them with these theatrical masks on. So there's a surreal quality uh, to this. I can you know, he, we, we know that he is in the video industry and um, very familiar with Japanese culture, language, and translates. And I, it does have a very Asian uh, kind of feel to me, that, that surrealistic, cartoonish quality. 
So he's a, they're looking in the place of lost children, but there's this protective, surreal, not fully humanized uh, veneer. And the dream ego is interpreting it correctly. You know, he's thinking to himself, this depiction's not quite realistic, but if it was, it might be too horrible to look at. Yes. So we can see the beginning of the analytic attitude is just very gently entering in, and and he's even appreciating the way the psyche is trying to mediate mm-hmm. the horror so that he can think about what's happening and not be overwhelmed. And we have a doubling now of the water image, mm-hmm. uh, the salutio, because the child that they are looking for is not on the ground, but is at the bottom of a nearby dark black pool, and the child has dissolved, just leaving an image on the surface of the water that is disfigured. And I looked up the cartoon character of Pug, and it's pretty bizarre. I mean, it's a pug dog. No? Uh, Look, I actually texted you a picture of the cartoon (laughs) character. Uh, It looks a little bit like um, a Mad Magazine figure. Ah, okay. But it's uh, it's very um, goofy and exaggerated and uh, buck-toothed and uh, wacky in that kind of Mad Magazine quality. And I wonder if that was our dreamer's experience, that something just was so distorted and weird and uh, surreal and cartoonish. Which I would imagine that there is something uh, representative rather than realistic, Hmm. which is also about the way that our minds work as children. (laughs) All our early memories are this amalgam of true sensory impressions and all this mythic material, archetypal material. Most importantly to me is that they discover the missing child is at the bottom of a nearby black pool and that the child has dissolved. It's a very powerful mm-hmm. statement, a powerful image. If I step way back and think about the dream as medicine, as the psyche trying to help, it is offering something that, whether it's the grief or perhaps the overpotency of his own child complex, has actually dissolved. And the only thing left is an eidolon, is just a phantom on the pool of the water. Hmm. But that something really is gone, which implies the search needs to come to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. So it may very well be that in the unconscious, something in him was searching for resolutions, searching for some conclusion to the feeling of trauma or tears. And of course, that's true for all of us. And Mm -hmm. we can circulate through a certain um, pattern in the psyche, of course, not Mm -hmm. realizing it. And when that finally can come to a rest, the search is over. We know what we know. Mm -hmm. And there has been a salve. Mm -hmm. There's a possibility for laying something to rest. All that is left of the missing child uh, is an image on the surface of the water, something very distorted, because this memory is at the bottom, psychologically speaking, of a dark black pool. He was only a year old. So it's, it's really in deep in the unconscious, as perhaps imaged in this way that something is at the bottom of the dark black pool, but all we have is just an image on the surface of the water. And there's a wonderful transition. The child complex, let's say the puer, the puella, is finally dissolved, and there's only, it's like an oil slick almost, Mm -hmm. on the top of the water that's just beginning to kind of float around and lose its shape. And then an older man who's confident, successful, and entrepreneurial is available. So for any of us, 
these trauma fields can lock us up in a certain quality of consciousness, in a certain conundrum. Mm -hmm. And when the energy begins to let us go, we find that our adult self, and for this fellow, perhaps this entrepreneurial, confident maturity, even audacity, is suddenly available to the psyche. Because the grief and the search for the puer, the missing puer, is finally come to a conclusion. And, and there are two men now. Just as there were mm -hmm. the two women searching, there are two men, the, the older man and the dream ego's father has also appeared. And it turns out that this man, who is a successful entrepreneurial and he even plays golf, has made this uh, artwork that is very striking. The paint is still wet, so it's still, it, literally, it's a work in progress, as we uh, often say in our stereotyped way. Um, and what is very interesting is I often think of these kinds of things as a kicker at the end of a dream. Uh, like an O. Henry story, there's a little twist at the end and the surprise, and here it is that this... Um, image that the man draws resembles Ayers Rock or Uluru. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Now, Ayers Rock, Uluru, it is a very mystical uh, home for the Aboriginal people of Australia. It's a sacred site. There are uh, petroglyphs. Uh, people have been lost there. There was it's a very magical, mysterious, ancient, ancient place. And that is what the man is trying to make the dream ego understand. Now, we could imagine the way he shows up in the dream seems very helpful to the dream ego. Just as you'd said, he's confident, successful, he's an entrepreneur, he has high risk tolerance, and he's also an artist mm -hmm. and a writer. That there's so many um, aspects of the psyche that are available. And Jung talked a little bit about the image of the progressed ego. That secondary to all the other figures and the self and other things, the unconscious is also always nursing the next expression hopefully the higher expression of the ego image on its journey to incorporate more and more capacity. In the associations, when he compares uh, Donald Trump, Melania, and then this reference to The Handmaid's Tale, which of course mm -hmm. is an extremely distressing story, it gives us a hint that the waking ego may not be able to appreciate the symbol of the entrepreneur inside of him, and in fact might mistakenly associate that with a painful patriarchal dynamic. Or, or just a suppression of, you know, I'm just thinking about how this distressing memory was simply recalled as a very interesting coincidence about two early infant deaths in his family of origin. And we have the image of this suppression uh, in the dream setting, which is like a hotel, and it's all very ornate, and there's a, quote, manager. And uh, in The Handmaid's Tale, of course, uh, women are terribly suppressed. Rigid structures and uh, authoritarian uh, dictate over their bodies. Uh, the handmaids were the ones who could gestate children, and that's what they were for, was to carry the babies of the sort of the ruling class, as it were. I can't help but um, reflect on the fact that um, the person who's chosen to represent all this and who's chosen it is, is Melania Trump. She looks perfect. She was a model. She can walk in um, high heels that are... Uh, literally and metaphorically staggering. Um, and here are these bizarre red Christmas trees with white bonnets. 
So somebody who is an icon, who she, as the first lady of propriety and beauty and having everything together, it is strolling past these uh, images that look like something from The Handmaid's Tale. So there's another, there, we, we have a repeating theme of kind of a cover-up. Well, but also I want to make that distinction between what's actually happening in the dream and then the client's complexes, which then get laid on the dream. Okay. Because what happens in the dream is not what his associations are. And I think it's the tension between those things that can be interfering with his ability to make proper access of the successful male figure. Because there's nothing despotic actually happens in the facts of the dream. But the dreamer, upon waking, thinks of a man who's that dynamic, confident, successful in these multiple areas, is somehow questionable, maybe despotic. So there may be something here that the dream maker needs, rather the uh, dreamer needs to examine. That is he denying himself a certain amount of dynamism, entrepreneurship, artistic audacity? Is that being held back because somehow that's become an object of suspicion inside of himself? And the fact that the inner father is intently listening to this fellow at the end of the dream, I think is trying to model something for the dream ego, is trying to say, listen, don't dismiss the libidinal energy in the dream figure, because those same qualities that you might put to good use are valuable to you, even if you see other people out in the world using the same forces in an inelegant, unskilled, or even shocking way. But we have to make a distinction between how people make use of their talents and the talents themselves. That he does have the right to be entrepreneurial, dynamic, confident, artistic, to write a memoir, create images of his life experience. And that doesn't need to go down a dark trail. That his version of that could be much more positive than some of the images he's seeing in the media that alarm him. I think it's very encouraging at the end that there are the two men, the father and this uh, successful man, just as there were the two women who went on the quest for to the place of lost children. And uh, this other, this shadow figure, the successful man, is not only successful in the world, as I'm building on what you're saying, but he's also artistic. And the image at the very end, where in the effort to make our dream ego understand, he gathers up the wet paint and shapes it into something that resembles this primeval, mystical, geologic, and ancient place. And I think that is the echo of, you know, this is where, this is part of the journey is to connect with these archaic, mysterious, somewhat dark realities. I mean, they, they ask people, um, the indigenous who do the tours and so on, and guide people around, ask visitors, please don't climb this rock, and people do, but please honor uh, our tradition. Please honor that there is uh, something here that is not just... Uh, fodder for uh, curious tourists and ego and will and I can do anything. So I think the dream is ending in a very positive way with the man who represents both artistic ability and success in the world and who points to there is an ancient, primeval, mysterious reality here as well. And that's true for all of us, that, there, that we have that straight Jung of the two-million-year-old man, that we, we have all of this history in us at a, at a cellular level, so to speak. You've been listening to This Jungian Life, 
From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.